This week in wrestling history, this was a busy week, 39 years ago this past week on September 17, 1981, Ric Flair won his very first of either 16 or 23, depending on who you ask, world championships beating Dusty Rhodes for the NWA World's Heavyweight title in Kansas City. Speaking of the Nature Boy, 22 years ago, on September 14, 1998, on a live episode of Monday Nitro from Greenville, South Carolina, they were in the Carolinas, that's flair country, that's horseman country, there was a like a horseman reunion segment, and Nature Boy Ric Flair made his grand return to WCW television. Now, to give some context here, earlier in the year, Flair went to Eric Bischoff, and he had requested some time off from a thunder taping to attend his son Reed's wrestling tournament, because his son Reed was an amateur wrestler. Bischoff refused. He said, no, you have to come to work. So Flair no-showed the taping anyway, and he went to his son's uh, wrestling tournament, and so Bischoff suspended him. There was a lot of animosity between Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair at that time, uh, and it blew over when they were in WWE, too, because Flair went after him. There was a whole incident in the back. They've since made up. I think they're friendly now with each other. But... This was a very real situation, and Flair was off television for a, a very long time. And this ended up being one of the most memorable moments in Nitro history. When Flair made his entrance here in South Carolina, you had all the horsemen in the ring. Everyone's all dressed up. Flair's dressed up. He's very emotional. He's always emotional. He's either crying or bleeding or both. And he did both things here in this segment. And he cut a hell of a promo. Bischoff came out. He was trying to kind of end the segment and cut them off. And they were playing this like a work shoot. Flair's talking about Bischoff and, you know, fire me, I'm already fired. It was it was one of the all-time great segments, honestly, in the history of Monday Nitro. A lot of real emotions during that segment. 21 years ago this week, in a match taped for SmackDown on September 14th, 1999, although it didn't air until September 16th, 54-year-old Vince McMahon became what I believe still to this day is the oldest WWF champion of all time when he beat Triple H in a no DQ match off of an assist from Stone Cold Steve Austin who stunned Triple H and placed Vince McMahon on top of him for the win. A few days later on Raw is War, McMahon vacated the championship and it wound up going right back around Triple H's waist anyway at the Unforgiven pay-per-view in that six-pack challenge match. We live in a world where Vince McMahon exists as both the former WWE champion Vince McMahon and the former ECW champion Vince McMahon. That is probably the only thing that Vince McMahon and Rob Van Dam have in common, that they have been both WWE and ECW champion. And by, and by the way, the ECW title... It was the WWE version, because Rob was never the ECW champion. He was the TV champion, but ECW died before he could win it the first time. So both of those runs came under the auspices of uh, WWE. 17 years ago this week, on September 16, 2003, at a SmackDown taping in Raleigh, North Carolina, Brock Lesnar defeated Kurt Angle five falls to four. In a 60-minute Iron Man match, the first ever 60-minute Iron Man match on TV, not pay-per-view, Angle had Brock in the ankle lock when the time expired. Lesnar did not tap out. I remember this. It was it was an excellent match. You had the issue, though, of having commercials. It was not live. It was a tape show. I'm almost positive spoilers leaked out. So it was very different in that respect from past Iron Man matches, but... It was an excellent match. 14 years ago this week, on September 16, 2006, Ring of Honor made its debut at the Manhattan Center in New York City with its Glory by Honor 5 Night 2 show. This was the second Ring of Honor show that I ever attended live. My first one uh, was uh, maybe like three months earlier, I think it was, in June of that year. The last show that they ever ran right around the corner in the ballroom at the New Yorker Hotel. That was the first show I ever went to. And then all you had to do was literally round the corner 
And that's where the line started to get into the Manhattan Center, which is where WWE used to take Monday Night Raw in the early years, right there. In the Manhattan Center. Not in the Hammerstein Ballroom, which is on the first level when you walk in, but on the eighth floor. That's where Monday Night Raw used to be taped. That's where Ring of Honor ran at first until they started running Hammerstein many years later. Uh, but this was the the Grand Ballroom. And only a couple of blocks away, they were literally in the shadow of Madison Square Garden. You were standing there on uh, 34th Street waiting in line. You look over your shoulder and there's MSG right behind you. That's how close you were to Madison Square Garden. The same Madison Square Garden that Bruno San Martino sold out dozens of times as the WWF champion. And Bruno was the guest of honor that night at the Ring of Honor show. The wrestlers and the fans, they gave him a hero's welcome when he came out into the ring. They surrounded the ring. Bruno went into the ring for a promo. Uh, and he was great because Bruno was still sharp as a tack. And he was, he was great. He was great that night. He was honored to be there. The co-main events that night saw Naomi, uh, or not, uh, Naomi, my God. <laughs> I just changed the man's gender. Naomichi Marafuji, definitely not Naomi. In his first GHC heavyweight title defense on American soil. That, that being the first defense of that title on American soil. Retaining it over Nigel McGuinness. That was one of the big main events. The other one, the main event, Brian Danielson beat Kenta to retain the ROH World Championship. That Glory by Honor show is still to this day one of the very best wrestling shows that I have ever seen live. Everything was great. Everything clicked. The Bruno thing was kind of the cherry on top to get to see him in person like that. And I was sitting in the third row that night, or standing, I should say, uh, when he came out. And it was just so great. I, I don't have... And it's it's You talk about a different era. I took pictures. I have pictures from that show, but they were all pictures I took on one of those uh, disposable cameras. So the quality isn't great. But you were allowed to bring it... Actually, I don't know if you were allowed to. You might not have been allowed to, but I brought them in anyway. I would buy the disposable cameras, take the pictures, and that's just how it was back in the old days of 2006. And only a couple of years later, I think, I got my first BlackBerry and I was taking pictures on there instead. It's amazing how uh, quickly technology moves along. Nine years ago this week, on September 18, 2011, at the WWE Night of Champions pay-per-view, Mark Henry put the cherry on top of his Hall of Pain run, pitting Randy Orton with the World's Strongest Slam, the second one I believe he gave Orton in that match, to win his first World Heavyweight Championship, clean in the middle of the ring. That was his first of two straight pay-per-view wins over Randy Orton. This is a man who was signed by WWE in 1996. And so many times they would start, they would try to give him the big push. You know, he had the sexual chocolate run during the Attitude Era. But then they tried to get serious and they wanted to build him up as a monster. And he was always getting hurt. He was constantly getting hurt. He was completely injury prone. And it just never seemed like it was going to work out with Mark Henry. He had won the European title and it looked like that was about as good as it was going to get for him. But they kept giving him chances, and you know he was working off of a, of a big contract. And eventually everything just clicked. Very late in the game. Think about that. Signed in 1996. It really was not until 2011 that everything fell into place for Mark Henry. And by then, he was a lot closer to the end of his career than he was the beginning of it. But that Hall of Pain run was great. He just stopped giving a shit, and he would come out and... He would talk smack like he owned the place and there was nobody in the world better than him. And he believed it. And it came through on TV. His promo his promo work was just masterful. He came off like a real badass. You know, some people say that's one of the things missing in wrestling these days. You have a lot of guys who physically are on the smaller side. Or maybe they're not great on promos or things are played up too much for humor. And it can be hard for somebody who maybe is a casual fan or if they're a new fan of wrestling, if you're an older school fan who remembers the days of all the big guys and the brawlers, uh, it could be hard for people to watch wrestling these days and buy into the fact that these guys are real tough guys. You didn't have that problem with Mark Henry during that Hall of Pain run. You know, he'd rip your head off and shit down your neck. And you can, and you can believe it. You could buy into it. 
And that legitimacy is part of and that and the fact that he legitimately was one of the strongest men in the world uh, really played into a run that did not last nearly long enough. He got hurt again. It cut his title run short. Uh, but that was a that was a big night. And you know, one of the things I was kind of hoping and thinking maybe they would be building towards was a championship match between him and Daniel Bryan. The ultimate underdog, Daniel Bryan. I think you could have built that thing up. You could have kept the title on Mark Henry if he would have just stayed healthy. All the way through WrestleMania 28 in Miami. And you could have built to a championship match at WrestleMania with Mark Henry and Daniel Bryan. And Daniel Bryan, the underdog going into it, somehow pulls it off. He slays the giant. He wins the championship, his first world heavyweight title at WrestleMania. I think you could have done that. I don't know if that was in the cards or not. He got hurt. Daniel Bryan turned heel. He had the money in the bank briefcase. He went heel. And they just ended up going in a totally different direction. Now, things ended up working out just fine for Daniel Bryan. But that's... I had been hoping that we were going to get that match at some point. Because I think Bryan... Now, Mark Henry was not known for having... Uh, <laughs> He was not known for having excellent matches, per se. I think him working that classic David vs. Goliath match with Brian in one of the one of the feature matches at WrestleMania, not the main event, but one of the matches at WrestleMania, I think that could I think that could have worked. I absolutely think that could have worked. Five years ago this past week on September 14, 2015, Nikki Bella. Made history, and in so doing, she pissed off a lot of fans by retaining her WWE Divas Championship in a match on Raw against Charlotte Flair. Oh, we've come... Would it be full circle to say that we've come full circle because now as angry as people get when Charlotte Flair is on TV and Charlotte Flair wins a match, Charlotte Flair lost this match, and people were very upset because Nikki Bella... Actually, I'm sorry, Charlotte Flair technically won the match. I take that back. But she was trying to win the championship, and you can't win the championship on a disqualification. And because the title cannot change hands on a DQ, it allowed Nikki Bella to retain and surpass AJ Lee's 295-day reign to become the longest reigning Divas champion of all time. They just wanted her to beat the record because, less than a week later, she dropped the title to Charlotte anyway. They just wanted to beat that AJ Lee record. I, I believe that. They were so close. It's like, let's, let's just do it. You know, let's just, let's just get it over with now. And, you know, as a heel, they played it up, the big celebration. And it worked out fine. You know, you want to get heat on the woman. And she got plenty of that. There were a lot of very upset people. Now, that same night, five years ago on Raw, Sting wrestled for the first and last time on Monday Night Raw, first against The Big Show in a singles match. I wasn't sure if I was watching Raw or Nitro. That ended by DQ, which then led to a tag team match at the end of the night with Sting and John Cena beating Big Show and Seth Rollins. That Sunday was the Night of Champions pay-per-view on September 20th. So five years ago today, as I am recording this, to the very day, that saw Charlotte that night beat Nikki Bella for the Divas title. John Cena beat Seth Rollins to regain the United States Championship. Sting also wrestled his final match, challenging Seth Rollins for the WWE title in a match that saw him take not one, which was stupid enough, but two buckle bombs in the corner. That's two buckle bombs more than he should have been taking at 56 years of age, which is what Sting was in that match. Up to that point, though, Sting looked pretty good. He even did a high cross at one point off the, the top of the post, down onto Seth Rollins on the floor. So he was moving around in there. He was not moving around like he was 56 years old. I thought he looked pretty good up until the injury. And I remember watching that night, and I didn't know how bad he was injured. At I mean, nobody really, I think, knew how badly he was hurt. Uh, but... What really tipped me off is you could see he couldn't get his weight under his legs and he sort of collapsed. And I wasn't sure if he was just selling. Once we had a little pause in the match and he kind of, he, he's like, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I got my legs back under me. I want to get back into it. 
I think Rollins went to shoot him off into the ropes and he collapsed like in a heap. And I remember seeing that and thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this is really bad. Something, Something is very wrong here. And I think there were also moments where you could see he had the gloves on, but like he was trying to get feeling back in his fingers and that's never a good sign. I give Sting a lot of credit because he finished the match. And if this were WWE today, I think they would have just called it off. But they went right to the finish. And he had put Seth in the Scorpion Deathlock. People were going nuts for that. And he got out of it. He put him in it again. That's when Seth pulled him down into the cradle and he pinned him. So he he saw that match through to the end. He was not going to let that match end that way. And I give him a lot of credit for that. I think it's a very sad way for a career like his to come to an end. You can look at it a couple of different ways. You can look at it and say, look, the guy went out wrestling for the WWE Championship in the main event on pay-per-view. And that is not the worst way for him to go out instead of a random TV match or a match at a house show. Not a house show, a uh, like an independent show somewhere in front of 50 people. There are a lot of worse ways to go out. It, this This was not the worst. But I could also look at it and understand where Sting is coming from when he probably in his mind thinks that's not how I wanted my career to end. I wanted to end it on my terms. I didn't want to end it because of an injury. And it sucks that his career had to come to an end like that. He has said that he doesn't blame Seth for it. It's just one of those things. Um, This was during a period where Rollins was sort of building up a little bit of a rep for being in the ring with people who ended up getting hurt. John Cena, remember his face exploded (laughs) off of a... A knee lift from Seth Rollins. I thought there was one other match that Rollins had where somebody got hurt. It was just one bad thing after another, it felt like. But this one was... The only the only thing I will say is this, in terms of assigning blame. And this blame, I think, can be placed equally amongst Rollins and Sting. I just cannot understand why they thought that... It would be wise to do a move like the buckle bomb to a guy who is 56 years old. And to this day, it's been five years. I will still, I will die on that hill. I will never understand why they thought it would be good. You know, Sting is in there. He can pretty much do most everything that he ever did before. That to me, though, was a move where even if you know how to take the move, there's enough risk involved where why would you even chance it? And to do it twice... You already did it once, and Sting was kind of feeling his fingers. But he was able to continue on. If they would have just continued the match and didn't go to the move again, it would have been fine. So that, to me, is something I've never been able to understand. Why they thought it would be a good move. Why why Rollins wouldn't think, you know what, in this match, let's not do that, let's try this. Or when he pitched it, why Sting was like, yeah, let's do it. Because I'm sure he was just trying to fit in and look I I don't want you to treat me any differently than you would treat any other opponent but that was just a really stupid thing to do and so that to me is is one of the more frustrating parts about how that whole thing worked out and finally here three years ago this week on September 17 2017 the same day that he and Gorilla Monsoon were named the permanent announce team for Wrestling Challenge back in 1986. The greatest manager, wrestling manager of all time, and one of the greatest performers really of any kind in the professional wrestling business. Bobby the Brain Heenan passed away two months shy of his 73rd birthday. Bobby, you know, he he came out with a book. Actually, I think he had a couple of books. And I never knew, for example, that he never graduated high school. He dropped out in the eighth grade so that he could begin working to support his family. So his story is kind of interesting in that in that respect. But I think of Bobby and I just think, you know, all the men that he managed in the Heenan family, it's a who's who of big names in pro wrestling. Going back to his days in the AWA, the Heenan family was not a WWF creation. The Heenan family goes all the way back to the AWA days. At least. He was managing the AWA champion Nick Bockwinkle. I remember him, yeah, I think of him walking Andre the Giant to the ring at WrestleMania 3 at the Silver Dome. And all the guys he managed from King Kong Bundy to Big John Studd, Paul Orndorff, Harley Race, Ravishing Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, The Brain Busters. 
Hercules, Haku, the Barbarian, Ric Flair. Now that wasn't a, a, a long run. <laughs> Uh, that was right, right around the time that Bobby made the decision that he wasn't going to manage anymore. You know, he had the bum neck and he was going to go full time into commentary. But they linked him up with Ric Flair when Flair initially came into the WWF. And so you look at the number of performers and wrestlers that he worked with and he managed across multiple promotions. And like I said before, it's a who's who of big names in the wrestling business. Yeah, you know, the 1992 Royal Rumble, I love to talk about that on the show. Anybody who listens to my podcast is probably sick of me talking about it. But I talk about it because it is the greatest Rumble match that company ever booked. And you had a ton of big names in it, and commentary played a very big role. The commentary of Bobby Heenan that night, along with Monsoon, is, it is the best night of commentary that I have ever heard ever on a WWF show. And Bobby freaking out, you knew the relationship between him and Flair... Every little thing, and then Monsoon trying to talk him off the ledge and just put him in his place when he was talking out of line. It, it was great. It was great. It was fantastic. And something that Bobby mentioned in his autobiography is that he claims that it was his idea. He was the one who made the initial suggestion about Ric Flair entering the Royal Rumble early and going all the way to the end to win. It was his suggestion that Flair enter at number one. And he claims that Vince McMahon uh, tweaked it. He just had to put his own little stamp on it. And so he made Flair come in number three instead of number one and then claimed that it was his idea. So that's what Bobby claims anyway in his book. Uh, I hadn't known that. But... Two men who can claim to be the last two members of the Heenan family if they really wanted to. Uh, the last two men that Bobby ever managed. A lot of people actually probably don't know this. CM Punk and Colt Cabana. They are technically the last two members of the Heenan family. It was a very short stint that Bobby had with Ring of Honor. He came in there for a little bit. But he did indeed manage Punk and Cabana. At least once. I don't know if there's video footage of it or not. Uh, but how cool must that have been for those two guys? To have Bobby Heenan walking you to the ring and being your manager? He went into the Hall of Fame in 2004. Still one of the greatest Hall of Fame speeches ever given. And his speech was already suffering at that point because of the treatment for the, for the cancer. But I mean, you could tell he was having so much fun up there on that dais. And the parting line about his only regret, the very end of his speech, he puts that line in there about, I only wish that Monsoon were here. I can't watch that without, I just can't. I can't watch that without losing my shit. Um, the, the hell that throat cancer put this guy through, even after he went into remission, because I think it was 2002 when he was initially diagnosed, I don't know if the cancer ever came back. I don't know that he ever had a recurrence of the throat cancer. He might have, but I think it was just more a case of the treatment that he underwent to put it into remission was so intense. It caused him so much suffering and so many problems and follow-up surgeries. And it, it, really, it, dis it really disintegrated his jaw is what it did. Because that's where they were doing the treatment, maybe radiation and stuff. And I mean... The stuff that this guy went through, you can say this about a lot of cancer patients, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's the sort of thing no human being should have to endure, no child, nobody should have to go through that. He had reconstructive surgery years later on his jaw. I mean, it was just one health issue after another. You know, there were constant stories about him falling. You know, every felt like every few months I'd read in The Observer that Bobby Heenan, you know, we got a note that Bobby Heenan suffered another fall. He broke his shoulder. This time he fell, he broke his hip. He broke his hip twice, I think, on two separate falls over the years. And I always found the most cruel part about Bobby getting sick, and getting sick specifically with what he got sick from, is that it was throat cancer. Of all things, think about how Bobby made his money. Think about how... Bobby made his money doing the managing, doing the announcing. It all revolved around his speech. It all revolved around his voice, using his mouth, using his voice. 
and this robbed him of that this this disease it could have been any disease this particular cancer was throat cancer and it robbed him of his ability to speak it robbed him of that gift of gab that he made a living off of it's the greatest gift of his career and it was taken away from him that to me was always the most shameful part about what he had to go through I had the chance, you know, the very first WrestleMania that I ever attended live. For all the years I've been a fan, it's amazing it took me this long, but I went to my first Mania only in 2012. That was WrestleMania 28, Rock vs. Cena, in Miami. And that was the last year that they had this Wrestle Reunion event. Wrestle Reunion ended up getting replaced, basically, by, by WrestleCon. It was like Wrestle Reunion 7. Because everybody came to wherever WrestleMania was, right? They all descended upon the host city of WrestleMania. You had all these conventions and independent shows and all these other events. And Bobby Heenan was going to be one of the people making an appearance, a signing appearance at Wrestle Reunion 7. And we were already thinking about going. I said, we have to make sure that we go see Bobby. And I remember going to the show and I saw him and he, he everywhere he went, he had his wife with him. And I remember seeing him in person at first and it takes you it, it takes you aback to see his appearance everything that he had been through visually when you look at him and his mouth and everything it was it took me a second it was like wow it kind of knocked you back a little bit but then you realize that's fucking Bobby Heenan over there and I was wearing a t-shirt that said that's not fair to flare uh, because I think barbershop window had a shirt you know, made at one point like that, and I just thought, it was a play off the Rumble 92 commentary, I said, I gotta buy that. I didn't know that I would be seeing Bobby eventually, so I wore it. And as soon as I walked over to the table, he took one look at the shirt, and he starts pointing at it, and he's looking over at his wife, he's like, hey, take a look at this. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I, yeah, I, I had a chance to just talk to him just briefly, uh, for a few minutes, took a picture with him and everything. And for me, that was a big thrill, because he was always a favorite of mine. And so that was that was great that I had the chance to to meet him during that event. I will say one last word on this. This happened probably last year, right? Or a couple of years ago, maybe. Um, actually, no, it was a little bit a little bit before that. Because Bobby died three years ago, so this would have been the year before he died. So about four years ago now. If you remember the whole controversy about Bobby on Twitter, there was a Bobby Heenan imposter on Twitter the year before he passed away and it's even more sinister than that because I assume it was the same person there was a fake account for Bobby's wife that actually predated the Bobby Heenan account and this person was masquerading on Twitter as Bobby's wife unbeknownst to people undetected and unbeknownst and when the Bobby Heenan account suddenly appeared it, it seemed like his wife was sort of endorsing it. Other wrestlers came out and endorsed it. And Twitter gave the account a blue check mark. And usually when you get a blue check mark, you would think that, okay, it's been verified that this is actually the person. So when the Bobby Heenan account got it, it was like real Bobby Heenan, and it got a check mark, everybody got all excited because, holy shit, after all these years, Bobby Heenan is on Twitter. How fucking great is this? And he would tweet and answer people's questions and he was talking about the current roster and praising Kevin Owens and all these people and there was absolutely nothing that would lead you to believe that it was not Bobby Heenan right it was a verified account he wasn't posting kind of weird stuff it seemed like it was endorsed by all the people who would know him and his wife and unfortunately not only was it not him Bobby's wife had no idea that there was an account for him she had no idea there was an account for her Somebody tipped her off, and she was like desperately trying to get the word out to people, saying, it's not me, it's not Bobby. Bobby is not on social media. He's not on Twitter. And there were a lot of very disappointed people to find that. I was one of them, to find out that it was not And then I was angry, too. I was very angry, because there were people who mailed letters to him of support and stuff because you know i think his it seemed like his wife had put an address if you want to send fan mail to bobby here's the address and people would send letters to him talking you know about how big of a fan they were and i know everything you went through with the cancer i just want to let you know that you know you you you've got your supporters here and i'm a big fan of yours and you know people sent letters in to some random address that was not bobby heenan's address 
I mean, just think, how sick in the brain do you need to be to do something like that? What possesses a human being to do something like that? Unless they're sick in the fucking brain. It's pathetic. It really is pathetic that people would do that. But it was easy to buy into because you would think, okay, Bobby is having these issues. He can't speak, but he can tweet. How great would it be to get him on Twitter? It would, it would have been the perfect outlet for him. But it wasn't him. And uh, he passed away the following year. And I think there were many more contributions he could have made in various ways to wrestling and, and WWE and doing different projects and stuff on the network and stuff that unfortunately we never got to see. We never got to hear. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that he will go down as the greatest of all time. Regardless of what anybody says. I think even Jim Cornette. Some people would say, no, nah, Jim Cornette's the best manager. I think Cornette himself has said that. Bobby's number one, I'm number two. Uh, you get, you don't get too much debate from people when you call him the best. And and being a manager is sort of a lost art in wrestling. It has been brought back. We have a lot of managers back on TV now, but it's not the same. It was an art form back then. Some managers really were the managers for the talent. And they would book their travel and kind of look after them. And it's, it's not the same. You don't have that these days. But Bobby was the absolute best. 